you know, you're ever traveling on a plane, they say in case there's an emergency, put your mask on first. And the thought there is, if there ever was an actual emergency and you have the potential to help someone, if you get knocked out or if you're hurt, now you can't help anybody else, right? So our practice really helps us to understand that when we are practicing self-care, like true self-care, we are honoring and sort of creating healthy boundaries around the things that fill us up that give us energy, that leave us feeling grounded and connected within ourselves, then we have more potential energy to give to other people, right? I have this ability to sort of pay it forward. Learning about self-compassion and being kind to ourselves when we have made mistakes is the most powerful aspect of mindfulness. And what that really has to do with is self-talk. So the way we are inside the thoughts that we learn we can direct because the majority of them we're not going to direct. The majority of them we're going to observe. But the ones we can direct every now and then are going to be choice-based. And through our practice, what is my body doing today? How does it feel? Not, oh, it should be, or it must be, or this or that. There's not that same rigidity. There's a practicing the quality of curiosity and kindness towards my internal space. And so bringing that into really any aspect of my life through the experience of mindfulness makes so many things possible. What mindfulness allows is for more awareness about ourselves and the way that we relate to this task, this job, this honor of teaching, however you relate to it. And as we start to continue to develop our own mindfulness practice, we start to recognize it really does begin with me. It starts with me, right? I can't control all of the kids in this classroom. I can't force them to do anything. But what I can learn to control or be in relationship with is my own relationship to the things that I am experiencing ways that I am responding to the things that are may be bringing me stress. My awareness to the ways in which I am structuring my own classroom that may be contributing to, to some of these things or what are some ways in which I might shift my own way of being in this classroom that might help to lighten this, this situation or make people feel more comfortable. Right? We recognize a lot of it starts with us. Not that we are doing anything wrong per se, but there's this ability to look at the act of teaching with some gentleness and some curiosity and a willingness to explore, right? How might this shift? How might this change? Not only for me, but for other people. So as we start to develop our own practice, we create this potential space for us to be more calm when we go into these situations, which might make us a little bit more calm and receptive to listening to what somebody else is saying to you. My ability to listen to anything that a student or a colleague might be saying with a little bit more openness, some compassion, recognizing like, man, I'm really going through some stuff in my own space. Over 180 teachers and staff of out-of-school time programs have been exposed to the mindfulness programming. And many of them have indicated for themselves that being able to have tools to take just even a few moments and take a step back if there's a challenging situation that's going on with a youth or anything else happening in the classroom, uh, to take that moment and breathe themselves and practice their mindfulness tools helps them to show up in a different space for the kids, for the parents, for the families. The thing is that we're not going to be perfect, right? We're just going to make our way in the world, do our best, and our relationships matter, our choices, our words. So when we do misstep, what does that mean for our practice? And what is our relationship with ourself that allows us to then interact with a moment of a mistake or a moment of imperfection so that we feel at ease enough with having been imperfect to then go back and address it?